you all here tonight for this uh, LAR limited assistance representation training. My name is Joanna Allison and I'm from the Volunteer Lawyers Project. Um, tonight we're going to be covering the nuts and bolts of LAR, the history of LAR, and then as you um, probably know, two breakout sessions so that you can learn the specifics of uh, the probate court practice and the land court which has just implemented LAR. I wanted to tell you about a couple of upcoming trainings. First of all, there's going to be a follow-up to this training sometime later in the um, winter or early in uh, the spring, which is um, going to include a housing court breakout session and a Boston Municipal Court breakout session. So uh, keep an eye on the BBA website and the VLP website. Yes, can't hear. Can you hear now? What about now? Okay. Um, also coming up, I just wanted to put a plug in for the BBA Ellen M. Car Ellen M. Carpenter Financial Literacy Program. They're looking for volunteers. You would be trained here, and then you go out to the various high schools and talk to high school students about financial literacy issues. And it's uh, quite interesting and a lot of fun and a whole different place to be as an attorney. On the 23rd, there's a brown bag incorporating pro bono into your practice which is um, a follow-up to this. They did it last year and all their questions were about LAR. So, um, so this time, since we're having this, you can um, move on to other aspects of incorporating pro bono. Uh, January 24th, Bankruptcy Basics. For those interested in entering the practice of bankruptcy law, we're doing a training on that. And then in March, uh, currently tentatively scheduled for March 4th, a negotiation training for folks who are working in court projects. Uh, and the idea there is that a lot of times we're talking to people fairly quickly and, and immediately going forward and negotiating. And this is about how to do that and how to uh, follow the ethical rules as you uh, do the quick practice that is part of a court project. I'd like to introduce the folks on the, the panel that um, actually matter. Um, so that's not me. Um, we have. Uh, Far to my left, the Honorable Jeffrey Winnick, who is the uh, first first justice of the um, Boston Housing Court. He was appointed to that court, I believe, in 1995 and has been a very staunch supporter of the Attorney for the Day project and also just the access to justice for all the folks who come into housing court. Uh, it's been a wonderful thing to watch. Prior to that, he worked as a um, clinical professor at BU and continues to teach at BU as an adjunct. So teaching is uh, sort of in the blood, I guess we can say, and he's been extremely generous with his time in doing trainings in housing law and now in LAR and other things. Also, we have Edward Notice McConnerty, who is from the firm of Hemingway and Barnes. Ned calls, uh, said today, when we're talking about limited assistance representation and what he was gonna be talking about, he says, I know this because this is my baby. I've been with it from the very beginning and you sort of follow it along. So that's, uh, we're very grateful to, to Ned who has done several LAR trainings and continues to follow the progress of this, this idea. This is a short background to LAR. For many years, uh, various particularly legal services attorneys but folks in the public interest were saying that there is a huge unmet need out there for people who who need lawyers they are people who don't qualify for legal services or whose cases don't fit within the legal services priorities which keep getting shrunk more and more as funding goes down but they cannot afford to hire someone for an entire case. They can't pay a $5,000 retainer and, and when that goes is worn down, add some more. And so people started lobbying for the idea of unbundling was what it was called. It, just a few years ago, it finally was launched here in Massachusetts as a pilot project in the probate and family court. And <coughs> two of the folks who are uh, speaking this afternoon have been involved in presenting and using LAR in their private practice shortly after that pilot project was shown to be a success. After that, it became an SJC rule, which we're going to talk about, and it began to be approved in the various courts. And that's where we are today with uh, a hope that it's going to spread, a belief that it will open up access to justice for an entire population that legal services cannot reach and that it will also be a chance to make money in your practice and be a lucrative proposition for you because 
are we understand that in the in order for access to justice to be complete and be continuous it's going to have to also be a, a money-making proposition so without going further I'm going to hand it over to Judge Winnick who's going to talk to you about the SJC rule all right good afternoon um, my presentation at this point is going to be fairly short I'm going to go over a rule which on its face is very short and uh, seemingly very simple uh, I'll come back later in the presentation and I'm going to start to give you some uh, suggestion of how this actually works uh, at least in my court and some of the issues that I've had to address from a what appears to be a seemingly straightforward simple rule the rule itself it's uh, it was enacted by the SJC effective May 1st 2009 all it did was authorize the trial court departments to uh, initiate a limited appearance representation program if they choose to do so each department uh, had to uh, enact its own standing order or rule to implement it so depending on which court you were in I direct you to the standing order of that specific court be it probate court land court or housing court or the um, district court because I doubt that they're going to change there are going to be significant differences but there might be slight variations that you'll need to read uh, what I'm going to do is just go over uh, with uh, in brief the actual SJC rule and it's in four parts the first part basically just sets up uh, the fact that a an attorney can enter a limited appearance but not every attorney can do so. You need to be qualified. You have to be a qualified attorney. What is a qualified attorney? Someone who completes a session, a training session or information session approved by the trial court department that you are appearing in. So I'm assuming, Joanna, that this is a approved, approved. information yes. session. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you walk out this door, uh, you will be approved and qualified. So I suspect that you need to sign something somewhere to, uh, so if anybody checks, uh, they know that you've been here. You can represent someone in a limited manner. You can limit the scope of your representation to a specific event, motion, task, if the limitation is reasonable. Now, what is reasonable like everything else you're going to be told it depends on the circumstances and likely the judge when you give the uh, clerk your limited appearance representation form if it will be the judge who raises the issue as to whether it's reasonable or unreasonable I've been dealing with this now for a year and a half maybe mm -hmm. two years I don't think I've ever found that a scope of representation proposed is unreasonable but it's something you still need to be aware of and ready to at least articulate why it is reasonable to allow a limited appearance for that event or task and finally most importantly uh, the client must give informed consent so that the client knows both that your appearance is limited and understands the scope of that limited or the limited nature of that representation and understands most importantly that at some point in time you will cease to represent that individual and that there are certain ramifications of that and those will all be taken care of in the forms uh, the consent forms that you're going to have an appearance forms that you're going to have your client sign which I believe that you're going to be discussing in uh, in more detail the second is uh, for whom can you appear you can appear on a limited basis for someone who is considered an otherwise unrepresented party that simply means someone who does not have a lawyer representing them you cannot use the LAR rules to enter a limited appearance to help out a colleague who can't come to court on that day because the client is represented with a general appearance you can make an appearance for them but your appearance would be a general appearance that you can then withdraw 
if you're just covering for, for a colleague, but you can't use the LAR rule for that purpose. You need to file a notice with the court if you're going to be entering a limited appearance, which will be discussed in, uh, in more detail. You have to identify the precise event and or the discrete issues that will be addressed in your limited appearance. And that's something that you need to be very careful with, that what you are there for is identified with clarity, both to your client, most importantly, and also, helpfully, to the court, so they know why you're there and when you're going to uh, withdraw. There are certain limitations identified by the SJC. You cannot simply uh, enter a limited appearance during a trial for the purpose of making evidentiary objections. So that's just not permitted. You either enter an appearance for the purpose of trial, and you could enter a limited appearance to conduct a trial, but you can't enter a limited appearance and then expect the unrepresented litigant to do the questioning and you will address and resolve uh, evidentiary issues. If you are representing someone on a limited basis, the client cannot advocate on his or her behalf as a unrepresented litigant before the court. It is you as counsel, albeit on a limited basis, who makes the, uh, the argument and the presentation. And that's something that you probably need to counsel your clients about because most of your clients will be more than eager to participate. So you need to understand that. You can enter a limited appearance for more than one event in one case. But each limited appearance is a separate and discrete undertaking, which requires a notice of limited appearance, and when that task is finished, a withdrawal of limited appearance. And then if you want to do something else on another day, it requires a new appearance and then a new withdrawal when it's done. Also, for each discrete event, it would also require a separate signed consent form from your client on that limited event. Something, again, that will be discussed in more detail in a second. If you are representing a client on a limited one motion or one event, you are still subject to the provisions of Rule 11 of the Mass Rules of Civil Procedure. You need to identify that if you help fill out a motion, you're, uh, something on that motion has to say attorney for the litigant for the limited purpose of whatever the, the case may be. Your Rule 11 representation is basically that the standard one to the best of your information, knowledge, and belief. There's a good faith basis for making the assertions that you've made in the motion and that they are not interposed for delay. Those are the representations that you are making. So before you file a, any pleadings, even with limited representation, do your homework. Speak to your client, check the documents just to satisfy yourself that there's a good faith basis for making the assertion or making the request. Obviously, there are certain limitations to, in terms of time and the ability to go back and do the background research, but within those parameters, just use care. It is important after you complete your specified limited task that you file your withdrawal. That's probably the one aspect of limited appearance representation that is most neglected. You forget to withdraw. And there can be some problems that flow from that that uh, you don't want to have happen. So just make sure 
that there's a beginning and an end to the event. With respect to what is your status while you are a limited, while you're making your limited appearance, the other side is obligated to serve both you and your client with any <coughs> pleadings, motions, or documents, or letters that arise from the scope of that limited representation. If you are representing the client on one matter, but the lawyer on the other side wants to file a pleading on something outside the event or scope of limited representation, you don't, they're not required to send you a copy of those pleadings. It's only if it is related to the specific event or motion that you've undertaken to represent. Sometimes not easy to draw a bright line, but it's something that you need to be aware. And that might uh, suggest that you tell your client to contact you whenever they receive something from the other side, just so you can double check. Now, within the rules of LAR, they also talk about ghostwriting, which is sort of an interesting placement for the, uh, the concept because it technically isn't a limited appearance and you don't have to file a limited appearance uh, notice. But you as counsel can assist an unrepresented litigant in the preparation of pro se pleadings, motions, and the like. However, the pleading must have the following words, prepared with assistance of counsel. Interestingly, nothing in the SJC rule says that you have to identify yourself as the lawyer who helped the litigant with the pleading. But nonetheless, if you do assist, you need to make sure that language is in the pleadings. I'll leave it to uh, my colleague to discuss whether, notwithstanding the fact that the SJC says you don't need to do it, whether it may make some sense to identify yourself as the person who assisted them. With a ghostwritten uh, pleading, you do not have to sign it. So you are not making any uh, Rule 11 representations with respect to, to that pleading, at least not in the technical sense. In a broader sense, you probably are. So this, I would suggest that even if you are assisting with a ghostwritten pleading, you hold yourself to the same Rule 11 standard. Uh, I don't see any harm in doing that. And I believe that that is the substance of uh, the SJC LAR rule, at least in brief outline. Terrific. <clears throat> Thank you, Judge. Um, as Joanna mentioned, uh, I practice at Hemingway and Barnes, and my practice is uh, almost exclusively in the probate and family court. Um, and um, I've been doing that for longer than I'd like to admit. Um, but it was clear to everyone in the probate and family court who practiced, the lawyers, the clients, the judges, that uh, unrepresented litigants were becoming uh, more and more of an issue to everyone. Um, and uh, so some time ago, we started trying to address this. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of uh, perspective on that, and a little bit of an idea of just how what limited representation means uh, and what it meant vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the prior practice. Um, and when I say it was a, uh, the unrepresented litigants were increasing, uh, I was the chair of a task force here at the Boston Bar Association some 10 years ago um, on er unrepresented litigants. Uh, and it was a cause of frustration to everyone. Uh, the judges were very frustrated because more and more unrepresented litigants were appearing in front of them. The pleadings uh, weren't well prepared. Uh, the cases may not even have been appropriate to be in the courtroom that day. Uh, many people were uh, appearing without having given service to the other side, uh, looking to the judge essentially to be their lawyers and give them advice. Um, so the judges were placed in a very difficult position and, and just moving cases through was difficult. 
<coughs> clients were frustrated because they'd walk into court uh, without a lawyer expecting that this would be a process like going to the registry of deeds uh, or the registry of motor vehicles and that someone behind the counter would tell them how to do it and give them relief and that's just not the way the court works um, and so they would be frustrated especially if they were told to go home give proper service to their husband or the father of the child or whoever it was and come back another day and take another day off from work uh, the lawyers uh, who were there were frustrated on several grounds one was uh, things went very slowly in court and they didn't want to spend a half an hour charging a client while some unrepresented litigant got a lecture about uh, how to serve process uh, and second uh, there were people appearing unrepresented who appeared to be very capable of paying for counsel um, and here they were uh, getting free advice from the judge uh, while the everyone else waited around the courtroom um, so uh, we looked at the question of uh, unrepresented litigants and um, everyone's answer was pretty much the same which was the old system where under rule 11 you filed your general appearance on behalf of the client and you were you know you told the client you yeah, climb on my back and I'm going to carry you all the way across the goal line uh, it's you and me together from here to eternity uh, worked just fine uh, from uh, many points of view especially in the in the uh, older days um, but that just wasn't happening anymore and the result was that lawyers weren't representing clients clients couldn't afford to hire the lawyers so what we've done is to try a variety of different ways of matching up lawyers with clients creatively uh, that makes sense for everyone so what we're trying to do here and what we tried to do was uh, first of all uh, we had to convince the judges that if we did the limited assistance representation they would have more lawyers involved in their cases not fewer uh, that lawyers people would uh, unrepresented litigants would hire lawyers for at least part of the case um, we hired we had a hard time convincing lawyers uh, to do this kind of limited approach as opposed to the look I'm your advocate it's you and me together here we go um, and um, clients were uh, I think the least uh, uh, difficult to convince to go along with us so this limited approach uh, made a lot of sense uh, in a lot of ways and what it does is to, to provide a kind of an a la carte uh, approach uh, so you can as you go to the restaurant you can decide on whether you want an appetizer uh, you don't have to do the prefix kind of uh, soup to nuts option so a client can hire you for one event pay you a set amount or an hourly basis uh, and then you can get out and then the client can decide whether to hire you for the next thing um, one of the big frustrations uh, and the, the uh, hard parts of the old system was that in a domestic relations context uh, for example if a client came in and wanted the lawyer to represent them in a divorce case the lawyer would have to file an appearance a general appearance under rule 11 that meant the lawyer was in the case until the court let them out um, which meant of course they were worried they were going to get stuck in the case forever and they weren't going to be getting paid which happened all the time <laughs> Uh, so lawyers started demanding these huge retainers to cover them for the whole case clients hesitated at the huge retainers the lawyers didn't want to take the case without the retainer more unrepresented litigants more lost work for lawyers more frustration for the courts so we changed rule 11 and we provided for this limited representation which had been successful in uh, California Arizona Maine places like that which allows you to get in and out of the case um, the specific SJC rule that we uh, recommended uh, uh, as a result of this task force and which was adopted by the SJC appears in your materials at Appendix 11. Uh, if you want to take a look at that, uh, that's, a, that's a very helpful thing. You're going to keep going back to that oftentimes uh, and uh, remember what uh, Judge Winnick has uh, told you about um, what those provisions are and what the importance of it is. Remember that in connection with limited representation we're talking about <clears throat> mostly in court matters uh, it was always okay to do limited representation on non disputed out of court matters so if you were sitting in your office 20 years ago and someone came in and said <clears throat> I sat at home and I pulled off uh, out of some form book um, a deed I've drafted the deed could you just review it for me 
spend a half an hour doing it, I'll pay you $250 to do it, no problem. That's a limited task. You do it, you get paid, and that's the end of it. Same with corporate deals and other things if they just wanted you to look over the agreement. So from an out-of-court perspective, it was always okay. The problem was Rule 11 said if you went into court, you were in for the whole thing. Uh, so we looked at both in-court representation and the increasing problem of ghostwriting. And lawyers were very frustrated with the, with the ghostwriting, which is if you're writing a pleading and then the pro se litigant goes in and using it, uses it. And the lawyers on the other side of the case would say, wait a minute, this is a pro se litigant asking the court to lean over backwards for them. <coughs> um, but in fact, it's been written by a lawyer. The court knew that there was a lawyer lurking in the background and somehow this was thought to be a terrible problem. And we looked at it and thought, it's not a terrible problem at all. It's a good thing that at least that client is going and getting help preparing the pleading. But it should be disclosed uh, to the court and to the opposing party so that we're all up front that in fact they've had help doing it. That's the reason for the certification on the pleading that it's been prepared with the assistance of a lawyer. And we didn't insist that you put your name on that pleading because a lot of lawyers didn't want to do ghost writing and then somehow get called into court by the judge, you know, asking uh, about this or that paragraph of the pleading. Um, so that's the reason why you don't have to put your name on it. Totally your own choice. Um, so that's a little bit of the a little bit of the background. Some things with limited representation don't change at all. First of all, one of the major questions was is my insurance coverage going to protect me in this kind of practice, uh, which is different from the old practice. On our task force, we had uh, somebody uh, who did uh, malpractice uh, defense for lawyers. The answer to that is yes. It's the practice of law. Uh, it's covered under your insurance coverage just the way that full representation would be. Um, what about ethics? Are we going to have a lot of complaints to the Board of Bar Overseers uh, arising out of limited representation and what are the ethical requirements? Uh, we had somebody from the Board of Bar Overseers on our panel. The answer to that was as long as we're understanding what we're doing here there is no different ethical uh, requirement here uh, and uh, you are still going to be subject to the usual ethical requirements. <clears throat> For example, competency. You must know your area of law. You must be diligent representing your client you must be competent. Uh, that exists regardless of whether it's limited representation or full representation. Uh, there is the duty of loyalty to your client. Uh, that uh, 